July 26th of 1989 in Kansas City, Missouri. 16-year-old girl was raped and strangled to death on her own bed while her family was sleeping downstairs. But it took police almost three decades to unravel the shocking truth. Fawn Marie Cox was born on 24th of March 1973 to John and Beverly Cox and was the eldest of their three daughters, followed by Amber and Felicia Cox. The family lived in a modest two-story house at 4640 East 9th Street on Van Burnt Boulevard in Kansas City, Missouri. A junior at the Northeast High School, Fawn regularly visited the church and liked swimming in her free time. As her parents' income wasn't enough to bear the family expenses, Fawn from a very young age started supporting her family by working part-time jobs and during the summer of 1989, she spent her vacations doing part-time job at a local amusement park. She was working as a cashier at Words of Fun selling tickets. On Wednesday 26th of July 1989, Fawn, whose work shift ended at 10 p.m., was collected by her mother and sister in their car. Feeling exasperated after a long day at work, Fawn immediately retired to her room on the second floor. Due to it being a hot summer night, most of Cox family members were sleeping on first floor as the only working AC unit was in John and Beverly's bedroom. Fawn, who shared a room with her sisters, was alone that night as Amber was out babysitting in a nearby house, while Felicia had decided to sleep on the couch in her parents' bedroom. The next morning at around 9 a.m., Fawn's alarm went off, but she didn't turn it off. To wake her up, her mother and sister went to her room, but what they beheld in that room was a sigh straight out of their worst nightmare. Upon discovering her inert body laying in bed, Fawn's mother and sister immediately called an ambulance. But at that point, it was too late to do anything and the remains of Fawn Cox were sent to coroner's office, who in his report mentioned her cause of death to be strangulation as there were dark bruises around her neck. Fawn was also sexually defiled by her assailant. Authorities investigated the crime scene and came to the conclusion that it was the case of a robbery gone horribly wrong. According to police estimates, whoever broke into the house on the night of 26th of July had accessed it through the window of Fawn's room by using a trailer parked outside. Inside the room, police found small fibers of hair, traces of blood and semen on her bed. These bits of evidence were preserved and were sent to the lab for further examination. Items missing from the room included radios, a Nintendo game console and stereo recorder. Most of the items were found outside the house as they were thrown outside the window to be carried afterward, but the robbers left in a hurry. An old army cap was also retrieved from the room and police thought that it was left by the assailants by mistake as it didn't belong to any of the Cox family. Fawn's sister Felicia told investigators that they heard nothing that night as the sound of their AC had pretty much drowned any noise from the outside. Felicia also said that on the night of 26th of July, their poodle was behaving strange, but the family thought it might be because she was pregnant. Assigned with the case, Detective Benjamin Cardwell has his theories about the case, and according to him, there were multiple perpetrators who knew the exact layout of Fawn's house. He believed that someone acquainted to Cox's was involved in the atrocious act that took place on July 26, 1989. Police interviewed witness after witness and one month after Fawn's murder in August of 1989. Based on the information presented by a witness, police apprehended three individuals. Despite their denial in the involvement of Fawn's murder, police found stolen items in one of the suspected teenagers' possession. This was enough to charge them, but the eyewitness halted their cooperation with police. Moreover, the results from the hair, blood and semen found on the crime scene didn't match with any of them. Even with all of this happening, authorities still managed one of the teenagers to confess that he indeed broke into Fawn's house with other teenagers to commit a robbery, but he later refused to cooperate with police and this meant 
that his earlier confession wouldn't be used to prove anything. However, he spent eight months in prison for those stolen items. With all these dead ends, the case of Fawn Cox became cold. But in year 2000, Kansas City Police Department, in an effort to decipher Fawn's killer's identity, uploaded a profile generated from the blood and semen samples collected from the crime scene to National Combined DNA in this system. The National Database tried to find a match, but as there wasn't much data available at that time, it was thought that there was another man beside those three teenagers who was there that night and he was the main culprit behind Fawn's murder. Fawn's sister Amber shares some startling details about her murder on a renowned website for unsolved mysteries, but her information didn't yield anything significant. In year 2018, Fawn's family urged police to use modern DNA techniques to solve this case, but the request was denied because police didn't have financial resources to do so. Detective Benjamin Cardwell said it would potentially take tens of thousands of dollars to sustain a genealogy program, money the department doesn't have. Fawn's family was undeterred in their belief that modern DNA technology had the key to solving this mystery and they started raising money for it. They bought billboards and even appeared on media where they urged people to help them in their bout to finally get answers to the questions haunting them for decades. Monty Clark, a bus driver who had driven for Fawn's church, helped with fundraising. He spent past three decades trying to research the case himself. Everybody was close-knit and everybody was trying to figure out why. You know who and why, he said. In 2019, 30 years after Fawn's death, the family erected a billboard offering $10,000 for any new lead which can lead them to the killer. In March of 2020, Amber, while speaking to a local TV network, said that she was deeply affected by what happened to her sister and was obsessed with her case. I ended up in the hospital because I got so overwhelmed, said Amber. In middle of 2020, with the help of FBI, the samples were sent to Parabon Nano Labs, a pioneer company in DNA analysis, and within weeks, the case of Fawn Marie Cox was finally solved, and her family was proven right in their belief that DNA held key to solving it. On November 11, 2020, using genetic genealogy, police finally revealed the name of the killer and it was Donald Cox Jr., Fawn's cousin. He was 21 at the time of Fawn's murder. Donald Cox Jr. was a troubled man and was constantly behind bars due to charges such as robbery and possession of illegal substances. Donald Cox Jr. was a drug addict and died of overdose in 2006. Because her death was under suspicious circumstances, the medical examiner had kept a DNA sample. At first, it was not entered in the FBI database because Donald was considered a victim at that time. But when experts told police about this, they matched semen samples found on Fawn's bed to his DNA and it was an exact match. Donald frequently visited Fawn's house and had an intimate knowledge of the house. That's why it was an easy task for him to enter the house. The other three suspects in this case indeed broke into the house, but Felicia said it would be of no use to extract any confessions from the three suspects, despite them being in the house during the evening hours. It was possible that Donald had been by himself at that time and only then acted against Fawn. She also added that these three suspects had already paid for their behavior during the period in which Fawn's case was unsolved. Donald Cox Jr. spent 17 years of his life thinking that he got away with the murder and never paid for what he did to a 16-year-old girl and her family, which is sad. But Fawn's family finally feels relieved as after 31 years of suffering from a tragedy, they have the closure they were waiting for. The answers are not always what we were asking for, but there's closure, Fawn's sister Felicia said in a TV interview. That's all for today's video. I hope you like it. And if you do like this video, leave a comment behind if you have any suggestion. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed so you're never gonna miss any of our future uploads. Stay tuned for our next video. Until then, goodbye.